Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michael Brown, and this is the 2013 State of the College Address. We are so happy to welcome all of you here to the Tacoma Park Silver Spring campus of Montgomery College. And of course, we want to say hello and welcome to everyone who is watching remotely online or on Montgomery College television. Now, Dr. Pollard is going to speak first, but we have reserved time for questions, so there will be time for questions after her address. For those of you watching remotely, you can email your questions at any time during the event to stateofthecollege at montgomerycollege.edu. So without further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce Montgomery College President, Dr. Darian Pollard. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Doesn't he have a great voice? Just like nice and smooth. Thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you to the audience in the room who's gonna give me their energy and their talent as we're standing here today, but certainly to all of our colleagues who are watching at different locations, who are certainly taking the opportunity, whether they be in their offices or at home or in other places, uh, to observe our second annual virtual State of the College. I wanna do a special shout out though to my beloved who's at home watching with my daddy. They're actually watching the speech at home, so I wanted to say hello to them, and hopefully uh, they can give me all the best criticisms that they can when I get home this evening. <laughs> Uh, I am proud of where we are as an institution. We have enjoyed a wonderful journey over this last year, and my, my intent today is to share that with you and to talk about issues that are working very well within our organization. We have undertaken a lot within the last year, um, but what's very important about that, and what I want to share with you very quickly as we go through this, I think we want to look forward, and we want to look forward with a sense of urgency for the future of this organization. But with that is a very strategic sense of urgency as an organization. So I heard the word urgency. I know, a few of y'all rolled your head. I think the universe shifted on its axis a few minutes ago when I actually used the word urgency. Because we know that this is another one of Darian's words that we hear from time to time. In fact, two, almost three years ago when I got to the college, I started using the word relevant. And it was very interesting to hear people's reaction to that. And what I'm very excited about now, three years later, we're using the word relevant quite a bit in terms of what we do and how we do the work of the institution. So what I think is very important for us today is that I hope as an institution, we come to embrace this moniker that I'm making, urgency, and to talk about it in very real senses about what it looks like at Montgomery College, but more importantly, think about how this approaches the whole world around us. Our leaders at a federal, state, and local level are all requiring us to act now with a sense of urgency. Let's hear some of their voices. A number of challenges hitting at the same time. How do you do more with a different type of student with fewer resources? And if you don't think fast about it, suddenly your institution will be behind. You'll be behind other institutions in the state, around the country, and around the world. And we can't afford that as a state, especially a state that is so dependent upon the educational abilities of its, of its citizens. I really do believe that we have a sense of urgency because we saw it with this global recession. We are seeing with the um, evolving technologies, et cetera, that you know, the workforce of today and tomorrow, very different from 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, we have to respond to that. We have to educate our students at very high levels. We cannot accept an academic achievement gap that disproportionately actually affects the majority of the students that we see in Montgomery College. And we have to make sure we match those students with the job skills necessary to be successful and uh, be great, wonderful, productive taxpayers, and hopefully they'll stay here in Montgomery County. There is a sense of urgency um, around the issue of educational attainment. Not only a K through 12 education, but the dream of a college education. And, but that is um, really bigger than all of that. It's really about how we build a future here in Montgomery County for um, young people who want to stay in this county and raise their families here, but also for the job market. We're job creators. Um, Montgomery College is creating uh, the new economy. And so this is a sense of urgency for a lot of reasons. Hmm. So you think about the things that they say, you wonder what do I mean when I think about urgency and the sense of urgency. 
Um, many of you may remember my spring opening speech when I talked about my fixation with the movie, actually the TV sh uh, series. I won't mention it, give it too many props right now. But what I will say is that was very interesting about The Wires, the idea that they're constantly talking about the game. Either you change the game or you will be changed or become irrelevant in that concept. How do you change and remain relevant in a way that speaks to the community that we're living in. I would tell you that higher education is changing so rapidly right now. A former Vice President Al Gore calls this hyper change. In fact, he has a new book out where he looks at the six movements of change that's happening in our society right now. And in this, he talks about the idea that technology is in fact driving this very accelerated, rapid pace of change that we have in our society right now. Five years ago, which I think is interesting, the word I was actually referring to an individual and their, this idea of what you thought. But it's amazing to me that now we talk about iPhones, iPads, I this, I that. Actually, I have a whole list here. iPads, iPhones, iPads, ITV. Somebody told me that's a new one coming out. So we live in a world in what I see, what I learn, I share. This is a very interesting, actually an interesting juxtaposition, I share. So perhaps nothing better sums this up when you look at uh, a picture by NBC News comparing two Associated Press photographs, one from the 2005 announcement of the new Pope, and then one from the announcement last month. These eyes are quickly changing the game, rapidly. Vice President Gore calls this hyperchange. I like to offer to you that I call it a revolution a revolution. While it may have started off as a technical or technology-driven revolution, like most revolutions, it has now seeped into every part of our life. Simply, everything we do is impacted by the rapid change that's happening right now. And there is, my friends, an educational revolution that's occurring in this country right now. Uh, I have an a, a, a issue, though, a little bit. Right now, I think that we see private organizations private foundations driving the change agenda for higher education right now. And while we benefit obviously from their support of us, they are experimenting with new ideas of higher education and we're having to respond to it. They're driving the agenda. So I contend, and you all know my English background about passive verbs and active verbs, I would prefer as an organization that we are doing the acting ourselves rather than waiting for someone to come and act upon us. We don't want to have that happen. That inspires, to, for me, a profound sense of urgency for the future of this organization. And I would offer to you that we stand at a critical juncture as an institution. We must either choose to embrace this urgency that's around us, and then we must also align that with our institutional practices in such a way that we're able to know that that change is seeping throughout the organization. So joining the revolution does not mean that we have to topple all that we hold dear, all the things that make this organization as distinctive and phenomenal as it is. We want to hold on to those things, but it also means that if we want to continue to evolve as an organization, we must look at the things that are driving that. We must look at our core values. We want to empower our students. We want to enrich the life of our community, and we want to hold ourselves accountable. But if we want to revolve, we also have to evolve as an organization. I'm proud to say that at Montgomery College, we are already developing a sense of urgency. It's happening everywhere, and it's palpable. Um, this sense. This feeling is something that I have, but I also think it's something that's throughout the entire organization. So I think that we have to act without delay. We have to continue the drumbeat that's before us. And this happened long before I even started using this term, sense of urgency. It's been happening within the organization at many levels. And I'm pleased today to highlight what I call hallmarks of urgency that are happening throughout this organization. Examples of the ways in which our current employees are embracing this idea of urgency and making the institution a better, and dare I say, more relevant organization. And I'm pleased that a number of the folks who I'm going to feature in these hallmarks of urgency are in the room today. So I want to thank you all for allowing me to use your stories about what you're doing at this organization. And more importantly, thank you for letting me tell your stories. 
It is with a, a sense of urgency that various members of our college community came together to start actualizing the college's new strategic plan, MC 2020. And this is how we are articulating the future for our organization, but very deliberately plotting out how we're going to get there. As you know, last summer, the board approved MC 2020, which I think is a forward-thinking, bold uh, strategic plan that looks at the next eight academic years as this institution. And this year marked the first year that we are in the midst of that plan. And it has required us to look at the institutions in very hard ways, to articulate some very bold and dynamic ideas about the future of the organization whether that be in our academic operations, our student services, our budgeting and planning, our community engagement, our human resources. But because of all of that hard work, I want you to know the one thing that you can take away from the speech today is that we are a strong institution and the state of our college is strong. It was this, last year this virtual college, uh, our, our State of the Union, State of the College, I should say. <laughs> I just gave myself a promotion, didn't I? Uh, what I think is important is I talked about our common student experience and the seven truths about how we want students to experience this organization. Truths that can every student, regardless of campus or location, credit or non-credit status, full or part-time, should expect about the way in which this organization treats them in the way that they want to experience it, and how those goals were aligned with our strategic plan. I'd offer to you that we're making significant progress. I believe our role as a community college is that we have to respond to the students that we have in this space and place, but also our potential students who are in the community coming to us. That's why this year I'm very proud about the partnership that we have with Montgomery County Public Schools, the partnership we have with the University of Shady Grove to create the ACES program, our Achieving Collegiate Excellence and Success program that we will be launching this fall. The program will provide intentional, direct, one-to-one -one outreach services to families and to students. And then this mentoring, we're going to work with thousands of young people over the next several years to talk about those folks and work with them who are underrepresented in higher education. That being African Americans, Hispanic and Latinas, students who come from families of poverty, students who like myself were the first in their family to go to college. A very important idea here. The ACES program will begin next year in eight high schools in Montgomery County where we will be having 960 students be in this program. That's right, 960 on the dot. That's what we have budgeted accordingly. Um, what's important about that, <laughs> uh, the public school will identify these students and they're going to help them look at a college track and then we're placing Montgomery College coaches in the high schools to work with both those students and their families about how to go to college and what that means and how to prepare yourself. I, I strongly believe that preparing the whole family for college is critical to help one student understand how he or she can go forward to college. And the public does as well. You might find this interesting to date. We have raised over a million dollars for scholarships for these students. Private folks who said this program is important and we want to contribute resources to that. So I don't know if that's a ringing statement of endorsement, but I'd like to think a million dollars means something, doesn't it? All right, so the advising and coaching will continue so that when students enroll at our college, they can later transfer to the University of Shady Grove. And this is a significant investment, and we know this, but we know that we cannot afford to allow any student to be unsuccessful in this county if we want to continue to have the lifestyle to which we have become accustomed in Montgomery County. This will lead, simply put, to better prepared students who come to Montgomery College. That's our goal, better prepared students who know what it is to go to college. As the first person in my family to attend college and to complete, uh, I will remember sitting at my family's dining room table and talking with my father about financial aid and trying to navigate the then, it wasn't simple, FAPSA form about how we we're going to complete and look at the college experience and pay for that. I know for a fact that my family would have benefited from a program like ACES. The idea that there's going to be a program that talks to families about how to navigate not just the classroom experience, but how to go to college, how to pay for it. And I know for a fact that my family would have benefited from a program like ACES, but I also know that these types of programs are significant because they can change the trajectory for an individual 
but also for their generations to come, right? I know that because I look at my son who now tells me, Mama, when I go to college, I will be a ninja, an engineer, and an artist. <laughs> I wish ACES had been around, but I'm so glad that we will have it in Montgomery County for our students. And as we're making way for these individuals, we also have to make way for their families, which is very important. So that's why this program is critical. But as these students come to us, we have to be thinking about how they experience their first introduction to Montgomery College. Last year, the idea of welcome centers was just that, an idea. We were kind of talking about it. I am very pleased to tell you that right now, this fall, uh, we are in the process of having welcome centers and planning on them on all three of our campuses. And I want to thank those folks who've worked tirelessly to figure out the logistics, where are they going to go, how are they going to be, how are we going to staff them. These will be a first stop, one shop, uh, one stop shop to bridge new students, to help them understand the information they need to focus on academics, not the logistics of the organization. These centers will supplement the phenomenal work that's already occurring by our enrollment services staff, and they will continue to be support and couple their work together to provide these students with a welcome entrance into the organization. In many ways, they will mirror what's happening already in our response centers, which happened on the phone. These are gonna be face-to-face -face response centers, welcoming students to the organization and helping them navigate the academic experience. Um, I will acknowledge there have been some bumps in the road, I know that as we've been trying to figure out them, I've heard about the painting, I've heard about the logistics, I've heard about the IT. All right, that's a part of the process, y'all. And we're figuring out as an organization how to make this happen, and I'm very proud of what we're doing in that regard. So each one of these folks, we're right now looking at these centers logistically, we're also looking at the staffing that we're needed to hire them. Now one of the things we know for sure though is that no doubt at the top of the questions that are going to come from these students is how do they navigate financial aid. Uh, quite like myself, they're going to have to figure out what that means for them and how they access those services. And this is profound, in the last five years we have seen an 80% increase, 80% increase in the numbers of students who are applying for financial aid at Montgomery College, 80%. And we know that has been a struggle. Our folks in financial aid work hard. They work very hard. And we know that, in, of course, in addition to this, it's not just collecting forms and counseling students. It's about accountability and record keeping. We celebrate those, those employees who are doing a fantastic job of working with those students. Yet with the 80% increase in requests, we know for a fact that there has been some challenges for those areas. That's why we've made significant progress as an institution, <clears throat> excuse me, in having our students have hands-on support to help them navigate that process. We've cross-trained college staff in such a way that they're able to work directly across the institution to support those students. This is the first place the students see enrollment services and financial aid. That's where they go. So we're trying to have those folks who work in those areas be cross-trained in a way to help students regardless of where they are in that process. We've expanded College Goal Sunday. We're actually helping students and families understand when and how they should be submitting their financial aid forms and providing free on-site professional assistance to help them complete those forms. I really wish I'd have had with that. Once a student is enrolled in our college, we have to make sure that we have the structure in place to help them be successful and help them reach completion, whatever their goal is in that regard. We've convened a college-wide group that's looking at advising, and it's called the Advising Steering Group. And they're looking to explore and establish a developmental advising model. This developmental mo advising model looks at the holistic needs of a student, their personal issues, their education, their career goals, all of those things, how do they come together in such a way to create a pathway for a student to experience this organization? How do we empower the whole student to self-actualize and become the, reach the goals that they want to reach. And I'm very excited to understand that they're working to have something together this fall in that regard. That is very exciting for the institution. Being effective in development or advising using technology and to help that is critical simply because of the scale of the number of students that we're going to be responding to. To our students who are eager to complete their education and receive their degree or certificate, they too have a profound sense of urgency for the future. 
They know that more than anybody, what that credential means to their success. We too have embraced this urgency and become a part of the education revolution. I'd like to introduce you to yet another hallmark of urgency, the e-portfolio. Portfolios are a tool that allow you to assess students' learning of course outcomes or program outcomes. And uh, it's a website that the student develops that they actually put together uh, through a course. Uh, and based on their development of that website, you can assess uh, the comprehension of the learning outcomes. One of the goals I have in the first year seminar is to help students identify their goals as a student and their purpose as a student here at Montgomery College, you know, why they came, what, what they're hoping to gain from being a college student. And so I saw this uh, portfolio as a means for allowing them to, to, uh, to document that, to create their goals and document that by using images in a more creative way than just writing it on, you know, on paper, which is what we had always done in the past. It's fun playing around with it and putting pictures, videos, and editing the, like, the colors and all that. It's, it's fun. It kind of puts you into working on it. You start building a mindset of how you want your, the rest of the semester to be like. Well, the one thing that I really liked about the ePortfolio is that the student can take it away. In other words, when the student graduates, they have the option to take it with them. I see it as a little bit of the 21st century resume, the tool for students to be able to present themselves in the best light and be able to use that with transfer applications as well as um, jobs. It kind of did motivate me into doing more stuff that I'm not used to, like take me out of my comfort zone. But it kind of felt nice sharing it with other people because I wanted to let them know like who I am, what I want to do, and what's, gonna, what's it going to take to get there. These types of tools allow our employees to be intrusive in the lives of our students. We know that they need that, and it's a very deliberate, and I celebrate the work that you've done in that regard. We know that no two students are, are, are the same, and we know that their experience at this organization is not the same. However, we do know that there are certain populations of students who are at higher risk of not reaching their goals at Montgomery College. In fact, if we look at the data, it tells us something very compelling. First, when we have uh, a tracking, a progress of a group of students four years after initial enrollment, we found an 80% success, success rate. That's very good, actually, That's very good in a lot of ways. We like to be 100, but 80 is pretty good. That is up about five percentage points than where we were a year ago. So that says a lot about the work we're doing within the institution. But when we break these numbers down based on race, we find that only two groups of students fell below the average. Those students who identified as black or African American, Hispanic or Latina. That is very important about why we as an organization are addressing very clearly how do we close the achievement gap of black and Latino and Hispanic students by creating, and we're doing this very deliberately by creating separate task forces that are going to be looking at these issues of the student experience and also more importantly the data about these students. And I look forward to hearing from their report a little bit later in the uh, calendar year in December. With more than 20 percent of black and Hispanic students not persisting, I would offer to you that that is a profound sense of urgency. Profound. We have embraced it, and we are part of the education revolution. Let me tell you about another hallmark of urgency at Montgomery College, Boys to Men program. You make it to college don't mean you're going to succeed, you know, in college because it's so easy to fall behind. But Boys to Men is a program that helps, you know, young youth that if you go to it, you um, have mentors and counselors who, you know, help you and give you the love and attention you need. Our primary goals were, first of all, to keep them in school. Uh, secondly, to uh, improve the GPA, transfer rates, and uh, their attainment of any degree or any award that they might be seeking. Already got a 91 out of 100. And we feel that basically the engagement, the, in, the relationships are crucial to keeping students in school. If they think that someone cares, personally cares, before dropping out, they'll at least talk to you before they will, and perhaps we can change their mind and get some resources that might make them successful. Everybody cares, whether it's a student, whether it's a mentor, everybody cares. It's, 
It's like a real, a level of love that you, I can't really explain. Patrick has been uh, one of my, um, our, I should say, um, brightest stars. I think Boyz II Men is a major impact. You know, it, it gave me a stepping stone on where I want to go and where I see myself. Patrick came in with a lot of, um, a lot of apprehension, uh, a lot of questions, but he was very candid and he was willing to learn. And at the end of the day, you have to be willing to learn. You have to be willing to try something new. Otherwise, we're not going to be a magic bullet for anyone. And so he's done very well. Looking to further my education, I want my associate's degree. And I'm hoping for a bachelor's also, but, you know, trying to, day by day, that's <laughs> day by day. What works here can be replicated other places and modified to that particular environment. I think Montgomery College should be ahead of the game, uh, simply put. I think we're one of the best community colleges in the, in the country, and there's no reason we shouldn't be ahead of the game. Hmm. Patrick is one life that's been changed by the Boys to Men program, uh, one of many. I think this is an interesting piece of data. Of the 41 black male students enrolled in the best uh, uh, Boys to Men, last year, all but one, 98%, I'd like to round it up if I could, but we'll say 98%, <laughs> either returned to college, graduated with their associate degree or certificate, and or transferred to other colleges and university. That's nearly 100%. I think this is commendable. Now, if we compare that, though, to the general population of black male students at our college, nearly 4,600 enrolled black men uh, last year, only 74% returned, graduated, or transferred. But boys to men only serves a handful of students, very small group, but it's a very intentional experience. So our task now must be to look at ways in which we can expand that program beyond the one campus that it's on and to include a larger group of young men in that program. Another special population that we must uh, provide additional support for are our returning veterans and active military members who come back seeking education at Montgomery College. This spring, our college serves nearly 400 veterans or active military service folks. What's very interesting about that, these folks have devoted their lives to preserving the freedoms that we enjoy, devoted them to this country, but return home in need of serious help. How to transfer their skills and knowledge into the world of work that we live in right now. We've identified spaces on each of our campuses to serve as centers dedicated to the specific needs of our veteran students, including space focused on helping female veterans. That I'm very excited about. So what do I want to tell you in that? The state of our student services is strong. And I look forward to and have no doubt that the work that we're doing right now on all of these initiatives and more will continue to strengthen the student experience here at Montgomery College. I'm exceptionally proud of the excellent faculty in the education that we provide to our students here at Montgomery College. Our faculty and staff are experimenting with new and efficient and effective ways to help students learn. They're creating new curriculum, uh, such as Women and Gender Studies program, I saw that happen this past year, and the Chief Science Officer program that's primarily driven out of our a partnership between Germantown Campus and Workforce Development. I tell you about these because they are improving access opportunities for students. We're doing it also in grant programs, our STEM grant. All our college has done has been very significant in this role. We're helping students meet their goal. And our college has all the components to lead an academic revolution. We have eager and talented faculty and staff. We have strong technology tools. We have exceptionally supportive staff. And all of that, we also have determined students who are helping and moving to reach a significant goal. But these students are only here for a short amount of time many of them two, three, four years, a short amount of time. So what is a critical question to ask is, do they have time to wait for us to get it all figured out? They really don't. It's our job to start that work very soon. How many of our students will miss out if we don't accelerate what we're doing as an organization? To these students, we must embrace a sense of urgency. In some ways, we have already become a part of the education revolution that's occurring in this country. Some of our faculty members have taken it upon themselves to join the revolution by doing some phenomenal work, looking at technology as a way of changing the student experience and enhancing learning. So here are two examples of another hallmark of urgency from our faculty.
Calc 1 this semester, and I decided that I wanted to do something different for, for my students. MOOC is an acronym for a massive open online course. So it's basically an open course that can have thousands of students in it. It's really limitless, and um, the instructor teaches it online, and anyone that is interested in the topic can just self-enroll. MIT, the site that I'm using, um, was one of the early pilots for that. So they have an open course for project where they just took each of the courses, videotaped them, and started putting them on, online. So what I wanted to do is to take some of that material that's online and combine that with our face-to-face -face class meetings to, to create a, a robust course where they, the students could do things outside of class, really learn the mathematics, right, and then come to class and have us gain, gain a deeper part. understanding of what, what they're doing. The MOOC that I'm developing for Montgomery College is called Get Ready for College English. We would have our main idea in the main circle. Students that come middle. here who don't necessarily place into credit level courses often don't complete. So I think what's most exciting about this project is that a student could for free take a, re take a course that refreshes their skills and then um, come into college at a level where they're not in a developmental class. Now what do I have to do though? So each class period is set up where there's a few minutes where I'll take questions, you know, about any of the videos, and sometimes explain a few concepts I think need, need a little bit of embellishment. But then the rest of the time is them working with each other, and that's where the real learning takes place. And so to watch those interactions is, is really, really impressive. It really has, has changed my attitude about, about teaching. The students are asked to respond to either a reading or a certain assignment that we've done. Um, they will be assessing each other's work. So in doing that peer assessment, they're also um, strengthening their own skills. There really is an urgency to, to learning this, this format because students need to learn how to learn. When they successfully complete my course, they're going to learn Calculus 1 material, but that's true of, of any format that they would learn this in. But what my students have learned is how to go about learning more material. And uh, love it or hate it, you have to learn how to learn online these days. So it should come as no surprise to you that Professor John Hammond was the 2012 Maryland Professor of the Year, and we want to celebrate him. He and Emily Rosado are doing phenomenal work. Again, faculty-driven, which I love the idea. They have the idea. They're making it happen. And many more of our phenomenal employees are doing the same thing across this institution. They're taking an active part in the education revolution. In the past three years, students in 33 states 33 states have taken courses through the college's distance learning program. I think that's absolutely amazing. So not only we are creating and empowering students right here in our own community, in our own neighborhood, we are doing it across the country. Now, I'm waiting to get to that 50 number, right? That's going to be pretty exciting. But 33 states that we're in, and we are changing their lives each and every day. We're reaching out of our community, we're serving our community, but we're also helping to empower our entire country. And I love that idea. There are big ideas, but there are also smaller ideas that are happening every day in the classroom. We have chemistry faculty. One professor is utilizing an application to provide students with tutorials to review concepts discussed in class. Isn't that amazing? An app on a phone to do that. Other faculty members are using their iPads to wirelessly project visual aids into the classroom and then enabling students to use their own iPads to work on projects in the classroom. I mean, that's absolutely amazing. That means that, you know, the iPad is not your mother's chalkboard, it wasn't my chalkboard, but you think about how this is happening right now in our classrooms here at Montgomery College. Many professors are encouraging our students to use technology uh, to create a virtual polling software so students can answer and text answers in online and have that to a professor anytime, any day. It's kind of amazing to think about that. So to continue, to continue this high caliber education, teaching and learning, I think that we have to ensure that our organization bolsters that. Uh, dare I say, even employ, empowers our students to, and our employees to do this type of work. That's why the work of the Academic Redesign Task Force or team is so significant right now. And, we'll, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, as you know, each of our campuses and WDC&E have historically operated very independently. Um, they work cooperatively and sometimes they collaborate, but really they, they actually function fairly autonomously and kind of do their own things to a certain extent. Um, and very important about this though, our students though are very different in that regard. This semester alone, we have 3,500 students who took classes at more than one campus. 
3,500 students who took classes at more than one campus. We must ensure that a multi-campus organization does not stand in the way of consistent learning experiences for our students and a continuum in the learning environment. For instance, many of our students take sequence courses where they're two semesters. What happens if a student takes X101 at this campus and goes to another campus and takes X102? And we how do we ensure that there's a continuum in the learning experience? How do we have substantive conversations about the textbook? Actually, I had a student talk to me about this and that she, he had taken a class at one campus, went to the other for part two. Not only did he have to purchase a new textbook and eventually drop the class and he couldn't afford the textbook, but very really, how do we ensure there's a continuity in the content of that course? How do we look at popular programs within the institution and we look at ways in which we can ensure that every student has access to those programs. One campus requires a standard exit exam when one another campus may not. My question is always going to go back to how is the student experiencing this at our college? We must take a very real look at college-wide practices. I know sometimes it's uncomfortable. I know sometimes it's exciting but we have to be engaged in that type of work, one that makes a, con, a, a seamless experience for our students, regardless of campus or location. Last month, the task force came to a campus near you to engage in what I might call vigorous debate. Is that fair to say? <laughs> a vigorous debate about what's happening, and I have to tell you, it's still going on. Uh, the next step is currently underway <clears throat> and will be for the task force to provide me a recommended model by the end of this semester. Uh, the task force started its work last April, I believe it is, and now they work through the summer, work through the fall, work through the spring. May is when they need to deliver a model to me. We have, and I hope that they will have a conceptual model that they'll have and that we'll work to implementation starting in the ac uh, next academic year. But I want to give you a preview of some of the things that they've told me are going to be important about the model that they're working on. One is that they will create and recommend college-wide academic leadership across the institution. That will produce an academic leadership team and such that we can look at and provide discipline direction across the campuses, all three of them. Very important work that has to be done there. This organizational change does lead to many questions, I'm sure that it does, and in some cases, some concerns, but I know for sure that Dr. Pearl and the task force are listening to you. They're hearing these concerns. I've heard that they're having vigorous and rigorous debate in the task force about these issues, and I know that they're going to devise a plan that's going to address these concerns and really think about creating greater accountability for the organization. I do want to clear up, though, one looming uh, idea that's been out there, a couple of questions people have sent me, which can, uh, pertains to whether the changes in the organizational structure will cost jobs. No. 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 <laughs> okay. I say this, that no one will lose his or her position or suffer a reduction in salary as a result of this reorganization. There will be some shuffling, right? We're gonna to have to shuffle a little bit. We're gonna to have to have and require some level of flexibility, particularly for our administrators who are gonna be in academic leadership. But we also will retain all positions in order to facilitate the new structure. In fact, there was probably a recommendation coming for some new positions to ensure that we continue to bolster the academic experience. And I'm really hoping, very importantly though, that this restructuring will also allow our full-time faculty to do what they do best, teaching. We know that. The institution allows us, and we believe that part-time faculty bring so much value to what we do as an organization. We know that they bring currency, expertise, flexibility, all of those things are critical to the academic enterprise at this institution. However, the organization invests in full-time faculty for a reason. We know the value that they bring to the organization, and we know the merit in the work that they do as well. That's why it's very important to look at the ratio of courses taught by full-time and part-time faculty. We have guidelines about that. We want to ensure that we're actualizing that and living to it as an organization. 
I want to wrap up my comments about the academic reorganization by saying a couple of things. Uh, one is that I hear you. I hear you. There is a lot of discussion going on, lots of emails, ones I get intentionally and the ones I get unintentionally. <laughs> that, that, that forward button is magical, I have to tell y'all. Um, and I know that we have vigorous debate happening within our organization. Um, I hear your concerns. I also hear the cheerleading that's occurring in certain places. I want you to know that I appreciate each and every person's ideas and perspectives, and I know that the task force is listening to you, and they're going to be engaging in the work of trying to respond to that. It may not be the answer that everyone likes, but they were providing answers that help advance the institution. I'll also tell you, I will not be interfering in the work of the task force. Contrary to the popular belief, the first time I saw the models was what, a month and a half ago, give or take? The reality about this is that this task force is engaged in critical work. I would never dare interrupt them or interfere, and that's why we have placed faculty and staff on the task force to assist in this very important administrative task. I should note that your voices will be heard. They're going to be a part of the decision-making process. And more importantly for me as an organization, we're going to design an academic model that responds to the needs of our students in a multi-campus institution. And I know that's good and it's difficult work, but I have to tell you, we are in good company. Uh, there are many multi-campus institutions across this country and they're all engaging in that work. In fact, I have a, one of my dear college president friends, we talk from time to time, and he'll say to me, how are you doing at your campus? I said, well, how are you doing at your campus? He said, well, I heard about this one over here. That's a part of the journey. We're going to create a model that works for this institution. But in my unbiased opinion, the reason I know that we'll do it is because we have exceptional people who work here. We have people dedicated to our students, and more importantly, we will preserve what works well by making adjustments as well to the things that need to be adjusted. So, what do I want to leave you with in this section? That the state of our academic affairs is strong. And as an institution, we will be stronger and more united in the future. Being proactive and embracing urgency also means that we have to help our students make it to college. And that's a very important part of the work we do. Um, engagement, this idea of actively committing to the work in our community is critical. I think that we have to reach out to underserved populations in our county and help them know that Montgomery College is here for them as well. It means engaging every member of our community by taking the college to them, not waiting for them to come to us, but taking the college to them. Each day that we do not as an organization serve these populations is a day and a loss for our county, for our region. Um, by not forming partnerships with organizations that are connected to communities and serving these populations, it is a detriment to our county. We have to continue to do that work. That's why that we have expanded the Office of Institutional Advancement which was formerly known to include community engagement. As such, the office is now called, I'm going to look, so I'm going to make sure I get it correctly, the Office of Advancement and Community Engagement, very simply put. For some time, the office has spearheaded and coordinated lots of work with our businesses and private entities about partnerships and scholarships for our students, looking at workforce issues as well, uh, trying to provide internships. Now they're simply going to move into a coordination role, but also a role of very clearly amping up that work. They're going to be looking at the students who should be, would be, and figure out how we give them access and gateway to this institution. And we know that members of our college community are already doing this work. What this office is going to do is help give them resources and help coordinate that work in a way that we can start to see a palpable energy happening within our county as it relates to many populations. It is to strengthen what we already do very well. Another goal for this particular office now is to establish what we call satellite centers um, in underserved communities in our county. These, are, these centers will be anchored to entities that already exist there and figure out how they can deliver and enable the college to support those communities and again create a pathway from where they are to Montgomery College. 
An underserved group our community that we're currently working with as well would be those who are incarcerated in the Montgomery County Correctional Facility. I'm very proud of this work that's happening right now. The college is helping uh, them to earn high school diplomas and provide them knowledge and access to higher education by giving them the knowledge and support necessary that they need so that upon release, they have access to higher education. We're developing curriculum for workforce development where we're actually going to provide classes such as digital literacy and building trades. Very important work that needs to be done. And it's going to take place in the correctional facility. And then more importantly, we're also trying to help that facility restart its award-winning baking program. Uh, this is very exciting for us to think about how we can help them think about a program they already had and rebuild it in such a way that it is sustainable. To the men and women in jail, a sense of urgency is more than a catchphrase for them. I can tell you that right now. For them, every day, as a day closer to re-entry into society and a day closer to changing the lives that put them in the situation that they're in. It is critical work. It is life-saving work. To them, this is a profound sense of urgency that they have. So if we don't embrace it as an organization, we're leaving someone behind. And I would offer to you that we're not fulfilling our duty to the community. The partnership with our correctional facility, I think, is a shining example of the outreach that we're doing to underserved populations and helping to fill a community need. Engaging our community means we have to listen to their needs. We have to respond to them. We have to adapt. We have to, in some cases, create new things to respond to what they need. One of those examples is a well-developed program, part of our My Best to help reach members of our community who are working to learn English while also acquiring the necessary skills to find a career. These individuals have a profound sense of urgency and I thank them for being here today. Um, here is a hallmark of urgency about our apartment maintenance program here at the College of Montgomery College. have a large number of apartments and property management uh, companies in, in Montgomery County. There is a huge need here. So when they come out of this program, they have two nationally recognized certificates that are industry certificates that are very important to them to getting a job and keeping the job. The world of Saudi Arabia, I can apply anything. I can find out the job. So uh, even I have an experience, I can the, nobody hiring me in the job. The industry generated say, look, we need technicians. We can't get enough people to fill this job. They took the initiative to develop a curriculum and, and, and a certification process. We have a good working relationship with the National Apartment Association in this project, and they've been supportive of us, and they've, they've gone the extra mile to make sure that everything is working smoothly because it's to their benefit. They have a vested interest in this kind of program and they're trying to replicate it around the country. Is that closed? You don't want What's nice about this track. is that it in integrates the yeah. basic skills into the technical training program. We have two instructors in the classroom. Right. One deals with basic skills, one deals with the technical content. And they team teach. 15 minutes uh, teach and stop. Another 15 minutes, the, the, the English teacher I check everybody, every student, how much they understand, how can they explore. If it is okay, we forward the, the lesson. Very good technique. So it, it really is, is a way to get the students the technical training they want, keep their interest level high, and at the same time give them the basic skills that they really need to succeed. This is a very important for us. Uh, uh, that means uh, we have a, a good, good opportunity to get uh, the, the proper job. And so I got a chance. That gives me every time I see that, I am changed. Wow. Um, we are doing phenomenal work. Um, and what's very important about this, we're going to do more. And we're going to continue the work in this. So what I can tell you unequivocally, that the state of our community engagement work is strong. And Montgomery College is making a difference in the lives of the students and the community that we serve. Of course, as I talk about the state of our college and the various hallmarks that we have uh, of urgency there across the institution, the critical component is aligning our dollars with our vision 
and our strategic plan. And I'm very proud of the work that we've done over this last year in this regard. The college has taken a hard look at our budgeting process. We've engaged in some significant conversations about that. And we're looking at it and responding to a number of challenges and making real significant changes to address them. The common theme in our discoveries was a simple one, that we have to look at the structure of our planning and budgeting process and align it in very real ways and have a very honest and collective look at how we can complete this, but also think about our long-term priorities. We have to look at more than just the year, but think about this in long-term. So as such, that's why we've implemented a three-year budgeting process so that we can anticipate revenues and think about the expenses. And at the same time, if we can, set apart a side of our budget in very real ways for future long-term initiatives. I am very proud of what we've done to weather some significant challenges as an institution. Um, we have done that and I believe and know for sure that we have emerged in a very strong state financially as an institution. I'm confident now that we have a system in place that allows us to ask the difficult questions, but also to align our resources with the vision that we have at the institution. One of the things we had to do as a result of that was to really look at the future and look at our talent. So this year, we confronted the reality that more than 25% of our employees were eligible for retirement, 25%. Uh, this created what I might call a, a bittersweet predicament for the institution. One in which we have to think about how do we handle strategically these vacancies while also planning for the future of the college. Therefore, the college designed and implemented the Voluntary Employee Retirement Program, better known as VERP, um, to provide the organization with significant advance notice of retirement and enable retiring members of our community to give their knowledge base to the college so that we could plan accordingly. It has been difficult in a lot of ways to say goodbye to over 100 employees who've taken advantage of the VERP, but it has been significant for our college and that it allows us to take advantage of some very key things. We can look at who we hire, how we hire, what we pay hires, and when and if we choose to fill vacant positions. And when we talk about the VERP or other vacancies within our institution, it's important to remember that the heart of all of this are the people, the people behind me. Brings me, and I want to assure you that our board is very clear about this and know who we serve and know how we do the work of the institution. That is why we have put our people first in our FY14 budget planning and advocacy process. In fact, we are very grateful uh, to the county executive who allocated $99 million in his budget to the count uh, to Montgomery College, representing an increase of about $3.7 million in this next fiscal year. And we are very hopeful and grateful to the County Council that they will hopefully advance and approve this budget plan. I'm also grateful to our Board of Trustees who are very courageous and do this work uh, very thoughtfully to approve collective bargaining agreements that recognize the sacrifices of our employees over the next uh, two years to provide salary increases to them in a very systematic and structured way starting July 1. All of our employees will receive a benefit of having an increase in their salary, but more importantly as well, the college will provide some additional days off for employees resulting in the closure of spring break, uh, the entire college next year. <laughs> now that was, a, that was a rousing applause, huh? In addition to that, we'll be providing funds for professional development because I believe it and know it for sure that if we grow someone individually, we also grow collectively. So what can I tell you that I commend our board also for taking a courageous and thoughtful stand on Monday to hold the tuition flat next year for our students. We are not experiencing that. So what can I tell you that the state of our fiscal and administrative services are strong and I'm very hopeful that the groundwork that we have laid will be something that we can build on for the future. So what can we expect in the next fiscal year? From academics, student services, uh, human resources, fiscal affairs, the state of our college is strong. We're doing phenomenal work. Yet we are anticipating lots of things are gonna happen and how we get ahead of that so they're not happening to us, 
but rather that we are defining the way in which it would happen. We're going to address these changes proactively and we want to align our actions in such a way that we are responsive to the environment that's happening around us. Now, as you may have heard time and time again, the college uh, accountability is a part of our mission statement, but it is an ever-present issue for both our funders and the people who let us do the work that we do, that being our accrediting body. Uh, the Middle States Commission on Higher Education examining our institution right now, and all of our peer institutions for that matter, with a more intrusive eye, can I say. Uh, we once uh, underwent examination every 10 years where we had these events, but now every interaction with our accrediting body is called an accreditation event. <laughs> that cracks me up. Um, in addition to more stringent procedural guidelines, Middle States is demanding more from us from a substantive review as well. The sun has set on receiving accreditation simply based on the inputs, the investments the college makes in order to educate our students. Right now they're looking at the outputs. How do we know what we say we're doing is actually what we're doing as an organization. And we must show them clearly the direct linkages between our actions and student success. And in essence, we have to have the analytics to prove that our students are able to do what we say they can do. And that we know as an organization that we're being reflective about the way in which we know we say we're doing so that our students can do what they do. See, it's a, it's a vicious circle right around in there. But it's a powerful message about the work of accreditation and what we have to do as an organization. I applaud what has already been happening. We have some phenomenal teams that are doing the hard work of looking at assessment of student learning outcomes. They're having substantive conversations about course numbering. They're looking at curriculum alignment in our general studies program. And we're gonna take an active role in determining our own future as an organization. Part of this heightened scrutiny, though, that we have to respond to in this organization is that we have to be compliant with local, state, and federal guidelines and standards. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the Affordable Care Act illustrates how we must act urgently in order to be compliant with federal law. This is a very important point, y'all. For some time, we've talked about the appropriate use of casual temporaries within our organization. We do this quite a bit. The law is adding what we might call an unprecedented amount of scrutiny and urgency to this conversation. Uh, there are undoubtedly appropriate times that we use temps. We know that we have a time-bound projects. We know that we have someone who has vacated a position. Or we also know that we may have seasonal staffing needs. Those are appropriate times to use temps, right? We all know this. However, <laughs> it is troubling, and I might say very disturbing, when we use temporaries and positions to perform the ongoing work of the institution over a long period of time. So this is urgent, you wanna know why it's urgent? Because now it's not just troubling or disturbing, it is not allowable under the law. It is not allowable anymore. Under the new law, we will be required to provide benefits to those who are working 30 hours or more on average during a certain period of time. So under the new health care law, we also have another issue we have to think about. We may also have to be required to provide benefits to part-time faculty members who shoulder a credit hour load that looks more akin to that of being full-time. Very important point. Part-time faculty members currently teach about 46% of the sections at this institution. And here's a confluence of a legal issue and then our continuing conversations with collective bargaining have been about this. And we're going to drive and we're going to have to thrive in this environment. And as a result of that, we're going to have to look at alternatives to ensure that part-time faculty members have the institutional support they need to ensure student success while also treating them fairly as an institution. That's an important job that we have to do as an employer. This July, we begin negotiations with our part-time faculty, and we will have a conversation about how to explore this and look at some possible solutions. There's also no escaping the fact that today's economy is going to require us to be entrepreneurial and to have an entrepreneurial spirit in the work that we do. This means looking at the money that we spend, but also how we get it, and specifically how we begin to diversify our revenue streams. It is only by embracing, I believe, a sense of urgency and looking at ways in which we can be active, not passive, 
that we can begin to focus on turning negative problems into positive solutions. That's one reason why you will continue to see the college engage with our colleagues in India and other countries around the world. This is very important. Beyond, I think, the moral imperative to help developing countries create access to higher education, there is also an opportunity for us as an organization. For me, it's just simply smart business. We are experts in a field. We know how to provide access to higher education. We know how to do workforce education. We know how to do developmental education. We know how to create a pathway from the first two years of an undergraduate experience to the upper levels of uh, undergraduate experience. We have the ability to market our services. And in turn, what's very important about that, we can create a new revenue source for the organization while also helping to strengthen developing countries. This is critical work. It's work that's very exciting, and that's why we have created Montgomery College Global Initiative, an arm of the college that will house and manage our revenue from global initiatives. We don't have none yet, but we're working on that. And that's very exciting work, that this will provide us the necessary component to monetize our intellectual capital as an institution. So let me bring this to an end because you all have been a phenomenal audience, both in the room and in the various places we have. Being on the forefront of global education is critical, but it also requires experimentation, innovation, and a sense of urgency. Look at any successful organization, and I would offer to you that you will see all three of those elements in there. Let me make a point for you and make a, an example that can be very real for you. You may never have heard of the bank called Umqua, bank. Um, but let me guarantee you, I hope that you will never forget it after this conversation today. 20 years ago, they had six branches and $150 million in assets. Today, they have 184 branches with $12 billion in assets. That was a B, not an M, y'all. Billion dollars in assets. How? By being very active, by instilling in their employees a profound sense of urgency and by creating a sense of community. Every Umqua employee can help any customer with any task. They, the bank signs local bands and they play their music. They have a free ice cream bars that they deliver to the community. That's pretty exciting. Man. We should have had one of those in here today, right? <laughs> they produce their own coffee brand and they give it to their employees and their customers. They host free events like book signings and yoga clubs and all of that. A bank now, this is a bank, y'all, that signs its own musicians, gives away free ice cream, produces its own coffee, and hosts free events. Why do they do it? Very simply, the CEO writes in his book, he says, quote, find the revolution before it finds you. A revolution is anything that is changing the industry you do business in. Let me repeat that. Find the revolution before it finds you. A revolution is anything that is changing the industry you are doing business in. Our revolution is here, y'all. It is right here in front of us. And we must be on the front lines of the revolution by, but also we have to be devoted to who we are as an organization, understanding our space and place and standing in it as an organization. To revolve, we must evolve. To revolve, we must evolve. The hallmarks of urgency are all around us, whether it be things within our institution, whether it be what our county and our state tells us, including the work that we're doing right here every day, I would tell you that the state of our college is strong. It is strong and has never been more urgent. So let's continue to lead the way in this educational revolution that is happening among us, but also the parts of it that we are leading. Thank you all so much and thank you to our audience as well.
Thank you, Dr. Pollard. And as promised, we have time for questions. Uh, we'll open it up to folks here in the room. And also, we, we're getting questions uh, coming in online. Um, please, any, anyone who has a question in the room, wait until I get to you with this microphone. Otherwise, nobody will be able to hear. And we're going to start right over here. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm forced to offer them student mental health program here at Tacoma Park. And one thing I did last year, I came to class and I bought my grandson, mm -hmm. who was nine years old, because his mother was too busy and couldn't carry her, him to work with her. He was so excited, he talked about it for weeks and weeks and weeks. I went to college. And that was very inspirational. What I want to ask is, you said you were going into the high school. Are there any plans in the future to go into the middle schools and mm -hmm. elementary schools with Montgomery College? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I think there's something magical about introducing students, young and old, to college. And what I think is very powerful about what you said uh, is this idea I've been floating around in my mind with, I might write about this, called college consciousness. Mm -hmm. How do we start to plant seeds about what it means to be a college student? And I, I know what that means. It was interesting, I think about my own family growing up, it was always inherent that I knew that I was going to college. You know, my, my, my father was very deliberate, the community, when you go to college, so we knew we were going to college, we didn't know how to get there, but I knew I was going to college. And I juxtapose that to my son, who's six, okay. who now knows that when I go to college, this is the pathway I'm going to take. We have, uh, he has a school next week, uh, take your child to work day. Yeah. So he's told mama, mama, I'm going to work with you to college because I want to see what happens at college. So there's something very magical about planting that seed and watching it, watch it blossom. Uh, the college has some phenomenal partnerships with MCPS already. Where we bring, a middle, matter of fact, I was just on the Germantown campus a couple of days ago, and they had groups of middle school students walking around the campus looking at it and being introduced to college. We do that on all three of our campuses. Uh, we have phenomenal work that done, is done in very uh, discipline-driven areas and science and so forth. So what I think is really interesting to me about this is that how can we start to do more of that work and then very, be very good with partners who may and may, uh, who can help us reach populations who may not traditionally think that going to college is for them. So your point is such a good one, and I hope that your grandson had a phenomenal day when he was here. He good. Good. Thank you. All right, we have another question for uh, from in the room. <coughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Heather Brown. I teach uh, music part time um, Hi, on this Heather. campus. Um, <clears throat> You mentioned um, all the initiatives to close the achievement gap, the boys to men, and the portfolios. Um, and it really seems like the relationships between faculty and students are really um, essential for fostering student success. Um, and the research backs that up. There's a 2004 study um, called Quality and, S and Frequency of Faculty-Student Interaction. Um, and it states that the single biggest predictor of student success, especially for students of color, is actually faculty involvement. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of our classes are actually now taught by part-time faculty, and we have to have outside jobs to make ends meet. I, I teach piano lessons in addition to my classes mm -hmm. here. Um, so since most part-time faculty have to teach and run, as I call it, they don't have the, the time or the office space to meet with students outside of class. Um, how do you think that the college will be able to reach your stated goals in Montgomery College 2020 um, without significantly increasing financial compensation and support for part-time faculty? Well, I, actually, I think that's an issue that we're looking at. I think as you, uh, your question is so important. We know the data tells us very clearly that uh, the greatest predictor, and actually we heard this in uh, one of our uh, speakers, to have someone call you by your name and know who you are and know what your experience is is critical. And faculty do that in the classroom. Oftentimes, outside of the enrollment services folks who help students get into school, the people who make the most significant impact on students' lives is not a president, it's not a vice president, it's the faculty member who calls them every day by their name and knows who they are. And I support that 100%. This is a critical issue that higher education is addressing right now. And as you all know, uh, this is a national movement that we're having a conversation about. There was a great piece that was in a Chronicle about two weeks ago that it talked about the dirty secret of higher education and part of that is having a substantive conversation about the role of adjunct faculty. 
Now, I, I would differ a little bit in your response, your question, that there are three, typically in my experience, three different categories of adjunct faculty. Uh, we have adjunct faculty who are working full time and the college goes and recruits them or they volunteer and we pay them a salary to teach a course. And they simply don't have the desire to work full time in teaching and they do that. But they typically are doing it because we need their expertise or their flexibility in a lot of different ways. Uh, the second group of adjunct faculty that we see are those who need and, and truly desire only to work part time. So it is supplemental income for them. It allows them to have some flexibility to do other things, writing, traveling, parenting, whatever the case may be. The third group is what I think your, your question really speaks to, are those adjunct uh, faculty who are working part-time but are putting together multiple part-time experiences and work so they can create a full-time living wage. That is a very significant issue. I would tell you that, at, that higher education, in my opinion, was never designed for that. So as a result of that, now we're having to have substantive conversations about how we address these issues. And the college, as you well know, is committed to having that conversation. We start negotiations uh, this summer with SEIE to talk about that, to figure out what it looks like. But there are broad-based ramifications for all of these things. And we have to be prepared for that. And it also means that we have to be prepared to ask the difficult questions and also at the same time have substantive answers about resources and the long-term implications. So, I love your question. I've, um, one of the things that I've said multiple times uh, to our adjunct faculty when I meet with them is to talk about student learning. And every time you talk about student learning, you advance the issue very clearly. That's what it's about. It's about how students live and learn, and more importantly, how the college has an obligation. Because more often than not, you probably can ask, most students don't know when they walk into a classroom if someone is a full-time or a part-time faculty member. Most don't, some do, but most don't. The reality then is to figure out as an institution how we're going to address this in a way that both in the long term is equitable, that's sustainable, and also looks at cultural issues in very significant ways. Thank you for your question. Our next question is an online question. Okay. It's from Jason Rivera. Uh, the question is, the Academic Redesign Task Force is comprised of administrators and faculty, but there is no staff representation. Staff play a critical role in the academic services provided to students, but staff just serve on the resource team. What can we do as an institution to begin to address sy systems of power and oppression that create hierarchical systems? Mm. I, I, you you got to love Jason because I, I, I love the way he just puts the stuff out there um, and asks the question. Um, what I think is interesting in this particular uh, scenario, and I don't, I don't know, I know that there are staff members on the committee, but I didn't know if they are resource people or not. That's a good question. I'll go back and follow that. I'm going to trust him based on what he said that he knows that. Um, what's interesting is, is also a greater conversation about roles within the organization. That to me is really what the question is about. Um, if we think about this as an organization, um, interestingly enough, um, according to the collective bargaining agreements that we have with our uh, entities, really management right has the ability to reorganize. They are look, they're responsible for organizational structure, they're responsible for the academic structure of the institution. Um, we did something different though. Rather than make this simply an issue to say that the four or five deans are going to come into the room with two or three provosts and a vice president and have a couple of resource people in the room and say, we're going to make this decision, we did something very deliberate. We brought other people to the table to be a part of that conversation. So I apologize if we did not have staff who are voting members, per se, of that group. And that's something that I will take as a, as a recommendation for the future. But it was not the intent, I think, to uh, create an environment where there was separation. Now, going to the other part of your question, we have plenty of that within the organization. Uh, I will say that because that is the nature of higher education. We have people who have privilege within an organization, and we have to figure out how we address that. Part of what we've done, I think, very deliberately in that has been through our participatory governance structure. Uh, when I arrived here, we had a governance structure that had no voice for uh, uh, staff who bargained collectively, we had no voice for adjunct faculty, and students were not a part of the governance structure, and no voice formally for administrators. So as a result of that, we had to spend time as an organization through a task force to create that. Uh, I'd like to think, I'd like to think, that in a few years we're going to be in a better place at addressing those issues, but there's going to be the angst that we have to go through as a college and the growth that occurs. One of my dearest friends in the world sent me a quote today, um, right before I was walking out here, and I said, I love how the universe works. It said, a change is inevitable, growth is intentional. 
So I love that idea of thinking about the fact that as an organization, our growth on these issue, issues has to be intentional and that we look at the structures as well as we look at the mechanism and the processes and we enter it in the in courageous conversations that we have to have to create the world in which we want to live in at the college. All right, we have a question here from one of the students, actually. Hello, students. How you doing? Good. What's <coughs> your name? Phoenix Bullerpool. Hello, Phoenix. I uh, <coughs> take classes at Rockville, but I'm a part of the men's basketball team. And oh. I just wanted to know, why is it that both of the teams aren't out of Rockville? Like, because the women's team, they, uh, they're pretty much out of Rockville, but we come down to Tacoma. But uh, the majority of our players, we take classes at Rockville, so it's, it's a sort of a struggle to get down, like to practice and stuff. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know what, what went into that decision. Yeah. So this is, how long have you been on the team, Phoenix? Uh, this is my first year. Yeah. So this was prior to your arrival. Uh, we had uh, a, a ruling, I guess I should say, a new law, a rule change with the NCJ, NJCAA uh, that indicated that uh, as a multi-campus institution, there are some things we had to do different in how we had our team structured. So as a result of that, we had uh, three men's basketball teams, we had a women's basketball team, and because we couldn't uh, field a team at one campus, they were coming from the other to play, and this violated the rules of what NJCAA said we could do as a multi-campus institution. So we had a task force that worked over the last year uh, previous year rather, to look at this issue, to understand what the rules and guidelines said, and very deliberately look at how to restructure our athletics program in such a way that we have um, one institution with one set of teams, not three men's basketball teams, but one, not two women's, but one, uh, and, and not three bas baseball, two baseball teams we had, but one. As a result of that, um, and this was a very deliberate process, this team sat down and thought about how do we structure these teams, but also to create one campus, we need to figure out how we locate these teams to create that environment for different folks as well. So we were very deliberate, looked at the, um, the, the facilities at each campus, we looked at the way so that every campus could have at least one major sport. I think that was really one of the drivers. So the Germantown team campus has baseball as one of its major sports. The Rockville has a women's basketball as its major sport. Tacoma Park campus had um, uh, men's basketball and then the other sports were put in in between, which are smaller sports but equally as important. Uh, your question, I think also to me, drives a bigger issue that is both a county one but also a college one, it's about transportation. Uh, realistically, uh, you should be able to, as a, camp, as a student of the 3,500 that do this, take courses at multiple campuses and have a reasonable expectation that you should be able to get there. We have lots of congestion, number one congested area in the country, I just found out in terms of traffic. But secondly, we also as an organization have to function the way that allows you to do that. We're looking at some issues in terms of shuttles to help with that. But the other thing is course scheduling. Uh, realistically, you should be able to take a course at Rockville and take courses at Tacoma Park and be able to get to practice. And if you want to get up to Germantown to do something else, you should be able to do that because that's what this college is about. So for me, that was the decision making process of how it went. Um, but we also want to create the infrastructure to allow you to be successful as a student scholar athlete. Thank you. You're welcome, Phoenix. And I love that name, Phoenix Rising. I love that. <laughs> Our next question, uh, sticking to a theme, sure. is an online question from Marcus Rosano. Okay. Uh, what about the state and the future of the upper athletic field, AKA former football field? It's badly sloped and needs leveling so that men's and women's soccer teams, which are both champions, can use it without reservation. Uh, secondly, there is an opportunity to use the field as more than just the MC soccer field with the synthetic surface and maybe lights, it could become a focal point for county tournaments. In my opinion, the field and the withering track are resources we can capitalize on. So that was a comment, not a question, Marcus. Um, but I, I, hear, I, I, I hear the comment. Uh, one of the things we're going to do is allow um, uh, Dewey, who's our new uh, Vice President for Facilities, to come in and have a couple months to figure out some of these issues in terms of to kind of do that assessment work. But then I would also argue that uh, we need to figure out how we fund some of those things, no doubt. Uh, we have phenomenal uh, athletics programs, uh, but the reality at the end of the day is that we have to also figure out how we support them. 
Fortunately, unfortunately, the state does not give us resources for those programs. So we have to figure out and raise private dollars. So if Mr. Sears were here, he'd say he'll take Marcus with him on any visit to any donor to be able to figure out how we can create uh, some agency around that and figure out somebody can say, I'm going to do that. The other thing is, does a college you know, try to privately raise dollars for that? Do we look at other revenue streams? That's a good conversation, and I think it's something we'll be doing more and more because we do have a championship teams, and I love that. All right, we have a question from here in the room. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Mohammed. I'm coming from uh, Rockville. Nice to meet you. Uh, I think I do have three questions. The first one is, uh, you mentioned in your speech today the gap between the three campuses in their program. What can you do to fix it as soon as possible? Because it bothers a lot, a lot of students. They do have problem in that. Uh, second question concerns boy to man You just mentioned that's a great program. What can you do to mm, make it a college-wide program and involve uh, not only black students, but, but black, white, Spanish, if possible, mm -hmm. as uh, in your power? And the third question would be, you mentioned uh, something about uh, uh, educational revolution. Maybe you may be prepared for it, but what can you do to better prepare a students as we to be, you know, more successful in the revolution education you just mentioned mm -hmm. in your speech? Thank, Thank you. you very much for the question. Um, the questions. Uh, let me say the first one. I think one of the things that we're doing is a, as a direct result is the work we're doing on the academic redesign. Um, this is a very interesting uh, conversation for us as an institution. Um, how do we ensure that a student has an equitable experience regardless of campus or location? What really drove this for me and started it uh, was a group of students I met with on one campus who made a very specific plea to me, uh, asked, actually posed a question that later turned into a plea. Why don't we have access to these services at this campus um, when we know that it exists at another campus? Um, why uh, is the student experience different as it relates to this particular program at this campus versus what it is at another campus? And that really is where this work is coming from. We spent time over the last year really looking at, one, the common student experience. What are the seven truths we really want students to know? Every student start right from the moment they walk into the door until they leave this organization. And that's requiring intensive work. Uh, it's not going to be something that's going to be done within the next year or two. Uh, we actually, as a part of a seven year strategic plan are looking at implementing the common student experience. We actually have the same thing with going with a common employee experience. So that to me is what we're trying to do. And, and to be quite frank, all three of your questions, there's nothing I can personally do. Uh, my job as a college president, I believe, is to articulate a vision, to go and find resources, and get out of the way and let other people do the job. And that's what I try to do each and every day. Sometimes uh, that direction might need to be a little bit of prodding, uh, a little elbow poking every once in a while, or asking relevant questions to get us to that point. Uh, I lost the second question. What was the second question about? Voice to man. Uh, again, a huge uh, a problem, a challenge, and I think I ended that section talking about the fact that we have this on one campus. Uh, the reality at the end of the day is that we need to be looking at how we scale this to all three campuses because we know the data tells us that it's, going, it's working. So how do we do it on three campuses? It requires an investment in a series of priorities for the institution. So this is something we're going to do, and we're going to do it across, and we'll put the resources there to do it. Very similar to the welcome centers. A lot of folks are saying, well, why did you invest in welcome center? Why did you invest in ACES? At the end of the day, for us, it's about priorities, and that's how you make those decisions as an organization. And what we also know the data tells us in the research that typically what you do for one minority group has the benefit of affecting also positively the majority. So we know as an institution if we can figure out what's happening, that magic that occurs in that group for boys to men, for one group of folks, if we can figure out how to replicate that across the institution and then also figure out how to do that for multiple groups, I believe, as your point, I think the question is that everyone will benefit from that as an institution. And the third question was, or did I already hit that? What was the first? Revolution. Educational revolution. You are the revolution. Um, our students are driving that. They're demanding that. Uh, I, 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 I am somewhat biased. I know in that um, I have a, a professional um, drive as it relates to the educational revolution. Yes, sir. You know, the reason I asked the question because I heard it from you. That's why I said you may be prepared for it. Yeah. But what can 
can we do to better prepare our young children to be? I think part of what we do is provide you with resources. We provide you with exceptional teaching. We provide you with support services to get you there. We introduce you to the discourse. You know, what I think is very interesting is that uh, I loved college. Uh, I found myself in college, and as a result, I've never left. Because as a re what happened in college uh, was, was profound for me. It introduced me to the discourse of higher education. It helped me understand the world in very different ways. So we have an obligation. I never forget, as an undergraduate, I've probably heard, said, shared this story before, Angela Davis came to Iowa State University. And um, she came in to do a speech. And uh, the, the, the night she did the speech, they had you know all the big donors in the front, you know, they had this the first couple hundred seats, and you know, then the faculty and the administrators. They had the graduate students who kind of had these elevated seats at the back, and then they had the lowly undergraduates. We got to sit on the floor along the side, right? But I remember sitting there hearing Angela Davis talk. But it wasn't the fact that Angela Davis came, it was happening the next day. So the next day, I went into the faculty lounge in the Ross Building where I was at, and there was a faculty debate. There was a political scientist, a woman studies faculty member, a philosophy faculty member, having a debate about black power movement and feminism and sexism and, 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 and talking about what happened, Angela did, having a, a, a disciplinary debate about that. It was like an, a high. It really was. Then, and then after that, we get done listening, so I decided to go get something to eat. I run down in the student union to the, to the little uh, cafe bar they had, and here were the graduate students trying to replicate what they saw the faculty doing, pontificating about X, Y, or Z. And I remember sitting there thinking, oh, one day I'm going to be up there talking like that, right? <laughs> so that, to me, is what it's about. It's about giving students access to higher education, introducing them to the discourse, and dare I say, making them sometimes uncomfortable with their knowledge, making them, oh, I don't know how to make sense of this. That's when I know I'm learning something, when I get uncomfortable. Um, so that's part of what I think we're doing. Thank you for your questions. Yes, sir. We have time for just one more question, and it's from the room here. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sol. I am a student from the CMT class. Yes. Uh, our training will be finished coming Friday. Uh, I have a one question. Yes, sir. I agree with you. Uh, before revolution find me, I will find revolution. Mm. Yeah. Now my question is, uh, now after we finish, what we need is the apprenticeship training. Now you said uh, the Montgomery College has uh, a lot of our campus. Uh, could you please arrange for us uh, for ap apprenticeship training uh, under your uh, college uh, faculties? Mm. I don't know, but I'll find out. Um, what, uh, this is a very important question that you're asking is that can the institution serve as a venue for the students in this program to actually work to get the apprenticeship hours? I don't know that, but I know some people who can help me find out. Yes. I will find that out. Thank you. Thank you. If we have an uh, apprenticeship uh, experience, we can find uh, uh, more, uh, 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 more chances uh, uh, when we uh, find a job at the outside mm -hmm. uh, industry. Dr. Yates and I have spent some time having a conversation about that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. That was the last question? Very good. I, I appreciate, um, I see, Beth, are you trying to say something? Is there one more? OK, no. He's, all right, <laughs> never mind. Um, thank you all so much for being a part of this today. Uh, thank you for your energy, your time, your talent, your smiles, and your waves every once in a while. And certainly thank uh, our audience who viewed this. I hope that you all uh, learned a little bit more about the state of the college, and more importantly, that you feel that and know that you are driving the educational revolution. So thank you all very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Pollard, and thank you to everyone here in the room and everyone online for participating in today's conversation. Now, I know we did not get to everybody's question, but there's going to be another great opportunity to have a conversation with Dr. Pollard, and that is going to be at her final town hall meeting of the uh, academic year. It's going to be on Monday, April 29th, so mark your calendars. Uh, there'll be information coming out as to where it will be and what time, but Monday, April 29th, will be another opportunity to, uh, to fire away with some questions and talk to Dr. Pollard. Again, we thank you all for participating today. 
Uh, the town hall will be posted online for later viewing at montgomerycollege.edu. I'm sorry, montgomerycollege.edu slash state of the college. And it will be posted online for viewing uh, for the foreseeable future. So again, we thank you all uh, for participating in the 2013 State of the College Address.